Hello Wayne County Community College students. Uh, today we're going to talk about viruses. Yay! That's chapter 24 and 25 in your textbook. So make sure you from, get familiar with the textbook um, chapters 24 and 25. Right, let me check that make sure that's correct. Yep. <clears throat> So we will um, give a, just a general introduction today and uh, get into the DNA viruses. And then uh, next time we'll pick it up with the RNA viruses. <clears throat> so you're already familiar with the light microscope. And we use that in lab to visualize bacteria, fungus, protozoans, um, uh, things like that. But do you realize that the cause of viral infections such as smallpox and polio were unknown? They were. But good old Louis Pasteur, he was a bacteriologist. Um, he hypothesized that there must be something smaller than a bacteria causing disease. So at the time, he was looking for something more specifically. He was looking for something more. But specifically, he was looking at the rabies virus. And in due time, he developed a vaccine for rabies. And, it, uh, and he coined the term virus, right? So he was correct that there was something smaller going on than just uh, bacteria. Uh, years later, they discovered more viruses, viruses that even infect tobacco, tobacco, mosaic viruses, um, <clears throat> viruses in cattle known as foot and mouth disease, and it was just, just a whole plethora of viruses. As time went on, it was discovered that viruses are non-cellular particles with a definite size and shape and a chemical composition. Viruses have the ability to infect every type of cell. Um, the ones we've already learned about, of course, we learned about bacteria, but these types of uh, things that viruses can infect include just everything. Bacteria, algae, fungus, protozoans, plants, um, and even animals, specifically us, humans. I'm going to concentrate on the human, uh, vi human, the viruses that infect humans because that's the kind of class you're taking. <laughs> Virus. So there are two theories out there about the origin of viruses. One is that viruses arose from loose strands of genetic material that were released by cells. Then they developed this protective coating. No, and, uh, and a capacity to re-enter a cell and use that cell's machinery and reproduce. The second uh, theory is viruses were once um, cells that regressed to become a highly parasitic, uh, to, to a highly parasitic existence inside other cells. Both of these theories have supportive evidence so perhaps viruses originated in more than one way. Viruses are considered the most abundant microbe on earth. And if I remember later on, at the end of our, uh, I think this will be a two-part series on viruses, I'll show you a virus that even I discovered. And um, it's an electron uh, micrograph of a virus that I discovered, and I'll share that with you if I remember to do that. So, how do you think of viruses? Are viruses dead or alive? I asked that question because a while back there was a commercial on television where they said like spraying Lysol, Lysol kills uh, bacteria and viruses. So there are some 
uh, virologists, people who study viruses, they phoned in, they called in, they emailed, they did whatever, contacted Lysol company and said, that's incorrect information. Uh, you can't kill a virus because it's not a lie. So I don't know what the commercial, it changed and said kills 99% uh, of microbes. So they left it at that. So to these virologists, viruses are not dead or alive. So we've taken it upon ourselves to say viruses can be active or inactive, okay? So it's best to describe the viruses as infectious particles rather than organisms, and as either active or inactive rather than dead or alive. They are definitely obligate intracellular parasites, meaning that the virus has to invade a specific host cell in order to multiply and then instruct that host cell to make genetic material, which is the other, make more viruses. And it uses that host cell's metabolism or metabolic machinery to make and release quantities of new viruses. So when you think about a virus, think of it as being a parasite that must have a host. And since I'm talking about humans, <clears throat> we're gonna say our cells, our body will be the host. And the virus has to get into our bodies and into us some kind of way to use our cells to replicate itself. And in the viral world, that's the only thing a virus is interested in is making more of itself. And how does it do that? It has to use the host's uh, uh, machinery and metabolism in order to do that. So let's draw um, a virus, just your regular everyday standard type of virus, and just see what uh, it entails. When I think about a virus, I think about genetic material being just wrapped around a protein wrapping around genetic material. To me, that's the way I look at a virus. It's just a, a, a particle of genetic material, RNA or DNA, that has protein around it to just protect that RNA or DNA. Please note, a virus cannot have does not have both RNA and DNA. It does not. It has RNA or DNA, okay? So let's just take a look at virus. So perhaps we'll have uh, some genetic material here. <clears throat> this genetic material can be DNA or RNA. And then to protect that genetic material, there's usually, it's usually a cap, encapsulated in something. And this is known as a capsid. This is a capsid, okay? This is a shell that surrounds the nucleic acid. So here's the nucleic acid, that's DNA or RNA, and here's the capsid that goes around it. Viruses that have this uh, nucleic acid and this capsid these two things together are called a nucleocapsid. So a nucleocapsid. Is the uh, nucleic acid. And the capsid as drawn here. So this whole thing is called a nucleocapsid. Viruses that only have the nucleocapsid are called naked viruses. They're naked viruses. In other words, they don't have an envelope around them. Okay? 
These are known just like this. This would be a naked virus. So we'll say this one is naked. It's only naked because it does not have an envelope. Let's draw the capsid here. Oops. Put some genetic material in there, DNA or, or, or RNA. And then let's put an envelope around it. And sometimes, not all of them, not all the viruses will have these kind of spikes, but let's look at this one. So you know that this is the nucleic acid, the RNA or the DNA here. You know that this, this is the capsid, but this new thing that we've drawn around, this new spherical thing that we've drawn around this nucleocapsid, this is the envelope, right? That's the envelope. Um, and what is connected here with the envelope? These things are known as spikes, right? So viruses with the nucleocapsid surrounded by additional external covering it is called uh, this right here. This is the envelope. This is an enveloped virus. And this one up here that's just got the nucleocapsid is considered naked. Right? Enveloped viruses are the ones that usually or mostly infect animals. And I'll say that as us being part of that group as animals, humans. Right? This envelope really comes from like it's a modified piece of a host cell. When the virus gets into the host and then it tries to, it goes, comes out, back out through the membrane, it carries a piece of the host uh, uh, cell membrane with it, and that is how it becomes envelope. The cool thing about that for the virus is it allows the virus to infect other host cells a lot more easily because the host cells will recognize it as self and then it'll allow the virus to attach a lot easier to the receptors on the host cell because it's going to recognize part of its own uh, cell membrane. So that's a pretty slick thing that this virus can, the viruses can come up with. Um, I drew this shape because a lot of them are that shape and this shape is known as a casahedral. Um, there are other shapes helical and um, let's see helical a casahedral and one that's let's see it's like three and of course spherical right but most of them most of the time when we think of a virus we just think of it like that so we could have that shape for a virus, you can have this shape, which is kind of helical, and then it can be a round shape, known as spherical. A casahedral, helical, and spherical are the three shapes that uh, viruses, viruses usually take. Usually it's these um, two, but specifically that one. You can look at the different shapes in your text. Um, the genome, meaning how the DNA or RNA, can be as small as nine genes. That 
those nine genes are seen in things like uh, viruses, like uh, HIV has a small genome, about nine genes, to hundreds of genes, and a large uh, family of viruses seen with hundreds of genes would be like the herpes virus. Compared to bacterial genes, which are in the thousands, and human um, genome, the human cell, which would be in like uh, thousands and thousands, right? So viruses are really, really small. And I know we started off looking at things through the um, bright film microscopy, but this, for to see a virus, you need an entirely different type of microscope known as an electron microscope, right? All right. Another thing about viruses is that they can be double-stranded or single-stranded. So they can have um, a double, so you can have DNA or they could be RNA. So it could be a it, we, we, uh, we'll look at it like this, a double strand. The DNA will be kind of like that. Or it could be a double strand, the RNA. And of course, it too will look like that. It could be a single stranded DNA or single-stranded RNA. And those are the types of genome that a bacteria can have. All right, we'll learn about these a little later and I'll point out which of the viruses are the smallest double-stranded DNA, which are the uh, only uh, single-stranded DNA, etc. So we'll point those things out um, later. Interestingly enough, though, for RNA viruses, they can also be segmented. Um, and the segmented viruses allow the genome to change their, uh, the way their genes are, where their genes are located. And I'll mention that as well when we uh, get into it. But only in the RNA viruses can, they're the only ones that could be segmented. And we'll see that because the interesting one is in the orthomyxoviruses, which includes the influenza virus. And that's why it is so, um, every year is so different because the different segments in it can rearrange themselves. They call it reassortment and make a different virus within that same um, strain, okay? the segments can switch order. So that's, I think is uh, interesting. Um, so we'll talk about those in just a bit. Right now though, uh, let me see what I have here. I want you to remember that this, you might see this word, veridae. This means it's a family. Family of viruses. This is for, for virus families. All right? and the ending in virus or viral genre. So if, this, if you have an ending, like say herpes veridae, that's a family of the herpes family. So we will mention that again too. Right now I want to, that was just an introduction to get you a little bit into what a virus is. Very, very small particle of genome wrapped in a protein, able to become a uh, intracellular 
obligated intracellular parasite um, cannot function without a host and that's why it's imperative that you don't allow yourself to be inoculated with this virus by touching your mouth, your eyes, your nose, or any mucosal membrane because viruses are very susceptible to being absorbed in a mucosal membrane. All right, let's um, learn about DNA viruses first and then I'll go over and uh, we'll switch to RNA viruses. Okay, let's start with the DNA viruses. We've broken it up here to viral genus. Whether or not they have an envelope, its DNA structure, and its medical importance. Hepatinoviruses will be the first group that we'll look at. Please remember, you can see DNA in here, so you know it's a DNA virus, hepatinovirus. And when you think of that hepatinovirus, you can see the DNA, so you know it's a DNA virus. Think of hepatitis B as a boy. Hepatitis B is the only DNA uh, hepatitis, okay? Hepatitis B is the only DNA hepatitis. All the other hepatitises, A, C, D, and E, and I know you probably didn't know that there were, there were that many hepatitises, if that's such a word, but the rest of them are RNA viruses, okay? So hepatitis B is a hepatinovirus. It can be in the form of acute or chronic. You could be in acute, get, get it uh, very quickly, be infected very quickly, or you could be a chronic carrier of hepatitis B. Fortunately, there is a vaccine available, and I think you have to get it in the steps of three uh, doses, and it will uh, inoculate you against uh, acquiring hepatitis B as a boy. The big deal about hepatitis B, it can also cause, be a cause of liver cancer, okay? Uh, this is, uh, even though it's hepatitis B, is not considered to be a retrovirus. Interestingly enough, like a retrovirus in the RNA virus, which is HIV, uh, HIV it does have an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So in your reading, you may read that hepatitis B has an, uh, can incorporate or utilize an enzyme, a, ret uh, a uh, reverse transcriptase enzyme, it is not considered a retrovirus. So let's keep that in mind. So that's hepatitis B, which is in the Hepatina virus family with an envelope and it's double-stranded. Let's look at this huge group, herpes virus, or herpes veridae would mean the family of herpes. They're all enveloped and they're all double-stranded. Let's look at herpes simplex virus one versus herpes simplex virus two. That's what HSV stands for, herpes simplex virus. Herpes simplex virus one, of course, has to do with the mouth or conjunctiva. So this virus can uh, cause uh, sores, little lesions or vesicles in the mouth or in the eyes. Herpes simplex virus two, however, is more of a virus that is located on the genitalia. So this one is usually the mouth or we'll say the eyes as well. And this one, number two, is um, infects the genitalia. So we usually look at herpes simplex two, herpes simplex virus two as a, a STD. Varicella zoster virus, varicella, varicella zoster virus, um, also known uh, to cause chicken pox and shingles, um, 
or we call it zoster. This virus is, um, it's a herpes virus, chickenpox is definitely a herpes virus. Um, if you've ever had chickenpox, um, this family of viruses, these herpes viruses, they don't leave uh, the body. Well, we'll just keep it at chickenpox. It doesn't leave the body. It lies dormant within the nerves and it can uh, be reactivated later when a person is under some duress or stress. That could be a hospitalization, uh, death in the family, um, uh, finals, whatever, however you express uh, stress. And it can come out as uh, shingles. So once you are infected with this virus, uh, varicella zoster virus, it can definitely present itself later as shingles. And shingles follow a certain dermatome, meaning a certain line of, of, uh, of nerves. So usually you'll get it like in a kind of a line around the eye, a line or so, but it's a huge, usually it's like a huge line around the back or around the stomach. And that is, uh, and it's usually pretty painful or itchy and itchy, but definitely um, somewhat painful. Next one is Epstein-Barr virus. Um, it can cause a mononucleosis. Usually we just um, take care of that symptomatically, nothing really to do. Burkitt's lymphoma, mainly seen in children in Africa where they get this huge uh, lymphoma in the jaw and they have a Burkitt's lymphoma. You don't see that too much here in the States but that is from herpes virus. Cytomegalovirus um, infection, usually seen in immunocompromised people, uh, people who's been suppressed maybe due to getting an organ transplant, they will have this type of herpes virus, a cytomegalovirus, um, specifically seen more like in transplant patients, people get a uh, kidney or something like that. And then HHV8, this is one seen in AIDS and it causes a cancer, um, name is Carposi uh, sarcoma, known from this um, HHV, uh, human herpes virus 8. So it, it will cause a Carposi sarcoma seen in AIDS patients. So herpes is a huge uh, uh, family of viruses. Let's go to adenovirus. Adenovirus um, does not have an envelope, so we have already learned that that means that it's naked. It is, however, double-stranded. It will cause a febrile pharyngitis, so that means a, a fever with a sore throat. Right? It can also cause a pneumonia and a conjunctivitis, right? And so that can be known as uh, this conjunctivitis from adenovirus can be a uh, pink eye, that kind of conjunctivitis, okay? Very contagious, so you know anybody with pink eye, don't try to touch them and then especially touch any mucosal surface on your body. Highly contagious. Um, parvovirus, some people have told me that they're Dogs or pets have parvovirus. I don't know. I don't know much about um, those type of animals, but humans definitely can acquire parvovirus. Uh, no envelope is single-stranded, so that will be a ding, 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 right? Because this is the only DNA virus that is single-stranded. So please remember that parvovirus is the only single-stranded uh, DNA virus. And you will um, remember that because I've just highlighted it and you always remember the outliers, okay? Anything that's different, those are things that get tested on. This is a very small virus, a single-stranded, very small virus. And it causes B19 in humans. And I imagine in, in dogs too, what people have told me. Um, this B19 is an aplastic um, crises, mainly seen in people with sickle cell anemia. Um, aplastic crisis is when all your blood cell lines are 
really low. The white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, everything is low. And you usually see this in people that um, have a sickle cell anemia. Also, the parvovirus can give something in children, school-age children usually, where it looks like their cheeks have been slapped. They're red cheeks and it looks like they've been slapped. And, but other than that, the child, the child presents as just fine, except these really rosy cheeks known as erythema infectionosum. That's fifth disease, also known as fifth disease. So it can cause B19 virus, seen in uh, causing an aplastic anemia in those with sickle cell anemia. And it can also cause uh, slapped cheeks. Slapped cheeks. Um, erythema infectio infectiosum in um, children. So just remember that. Also, this is known as fifth disease. That's what most people call it anyway. All right? But it does protect the child's been slapped. All right, that's parvovirus. Remember, a small, single-stranded, and can cause aplastic anemia, fifth disease, the slap cheek disease, also known as erythema infectionosa. Okay? Infects, yeah. So, uh, papilloma virus has no envelope, it's double stranded. Um, papilloma virus causes human papilloma virus, which are known as warts, and they can lead to cervical cancer. There's now a vaccine out for uh, HPV, and they recommend that you get this vaccine for boys as well as girls especially um, uh, girls that are uh, sexually active at a young age, because those are people that are more susceptible to getting HPV. Girls that are um, starting sexual activity at a younger age, they have a tendency to, as they get older, to have uh, That means they're gonna have more partners usually, and boys who will perform uh, uh, cunnilingus on the female can get uh, H these uh, kind of warts or HPV in their uh, throat. So there's a vaccine for that. Encouraged to get boys and girls both vaccinated for that. Pox virus. Pox virus is um, interesting in that it is has an envelope. It is double stranded, but pox virus is the largest of the DNA viruses. Pox virus is the largest of the DNA viruses, while parvovirus was the smallest, right? Okay, another thing about pox virus is it is not shaped as an icosahedral. Here we have all DNA viruses are shaped as an icosahedral except the pox virus. Pox virus is a huge virus, really big virus in comparison to the viruses. But it's not shaped like an icosahedral. It's shaped more like a brick or, or it can be shaped oval shaped, which doesn't fit the three shapes that I told you about before, helical and, and uh, spherical. So anyway, this is a little odd, this pox virus. Fortunately, though, with this little odd virus, it caused smallpox, but smallpox has been eradicated from the face of the earth Although, of course, some people decided to keep some of the virus, and there are probably some in labs um, that they're storing for whatever reason. Uh, a molluscum contagiosum are these little kind of raised bumps that you could get with this um, pox virus. Highly, can be highly contagious, especially they're kind of itchy, you scratch them, and if they pop open or something, then that fluid in them can be highly contagious to other people. They're little raised bumps, um, they're not wart-like, but they just a collection of bumps, kind of red, molluscum pretentiosum. But with this category, unfortunately, smallpox has been eradicated from the face of the earth uh, in humans. I think it's still vials, uh, vials uh, available for whatever reason. Uh, poly, uh, poly Paloma virus, paloma virus does not have an envelope. 
It is double-stranded. There's a virus. This virus causes JC virus, which is known as progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So that's a PML. PML is a disease that this virus really gets to the brain and you don't come back for it, like from it, like it's no cure for it. Um, you just end up with an encephalopathy, um, uh, a lot of uh, delusions, and you just don't recover from that. So these are the DNA viruses. Let me give you a mnemonic for it. So here you have HHA and then four Ps. So let me put it in red so you can kind of remember it. And this is the way I remember the DNA viruses. So H, right? H, then A for adeno, then these four Ps. And I just put a Y on it to make it happy. So hepatno, herpes, adeno, parvo, papilloma, pox, and uh, um, polymyoma, and then I just put the Y on it. And those are the uh, uh, DNA viruses. Those are the ones that I'm going to expect you to be familiar with and uh, know something about. And when we get back, we'll go over the RNA viruses and then we'll just bring it all home and discuss um, the viruses in general. All right, so that's it for now. We'll get back to the RNA viruses next. Mm -hmm.